Shane, it's uh, nice to see you. Thank you for joining uh, me today. Uh, first of all, I want to ask you about your history with the Hillside Festival in Guelph. You've been attending for a long time. Do you have any recollections of your earliest appearances there? I remember the first year doing it, and we got asked to do the uh, the gospel tent, which I was really nervous about because I'm not a religious person at all. So it's kind of freaking out about what what I would have to say and what I would have to present, uh, especially that early in the morning. It's always that morning tent, you know, and poetry is not a morning sport. <laughs> you know, it's very much, for me, a very much an evening thing. So uh, I remember being just incredibly nervous. Um, I know, just parental guidance warning. There's some language in this one. And I, I wouldn't use it if it wasn't the truth and important to what actually happened. So. People hear the word poetry and they tend to want to run the other direction, you know, so. Is it fair to say, Shane, that for your performances, you really have to get into a zone, I'm air quoting, but like you have to get into a space that I find unbelievable. Like I can tell that you're, you're entering the, the zone, the realm of having to deliver these very powerful pieces. Is that what it's like for you on stage? Do you enter some sort of altered state? I wouldn't say it's an altered state, but one of the things that I have to do before I perform a piece, because they're so very much about my life, um, is I have to step back into the, that emotional space when, when or where I wrote it or what it was, what it was about. And so that can be really challenging as well, because a lot of the topics I deal with are, they can be quite heavy. And so going to those spaces over and over again can be quite exhausting. Like when people come to a Shane Koizan show or Shane Koizan short story long show, we tend to, you know, it's, it's very much an emotional, I hate the term emotional roller coaster, but that's kind of, what it is we like to take people through the paces of you know the sort of human experience and uh i think a lot of the times like audiences are they're almost looking for permission to be emotional you know it a lot of a lot of our lives a lot of the way we operate in just society we're told to shut down that part of ourselves. You know, whether it's you're at work and you have an emotional day, they want to send you home because you're not as productive. I feel like the arts and what we do in particular gives people permission to access that part of themselves, um, which in a lot of other areas of life is just, you know, it's, it's off limits. So we want people to have that experience because that's the experience that I'm having or have had. I want to go back to the Gospel Hour performance that you were alluding to earlier. Um, and in particular, you did a piece uh, about a, a boy being in a hospital and making friends with a boy named Lewis. First of all, tell us about that piece. What's it called? What, where did that come from? Um, the piece is called The Crickets Have Arthritis. Um, my mom had uh, my mom had a long battle with MS and we were trying to do everything we could think of to try and make things better. And I ended up going in for a bone marrow transplant and just ended up in the hospital and having this very brief interaction with my roommate at the time. Um, I, I, there's like, I mean, I think the piece speaks for itself. There's certainly some poetic license that's taken there, obviously. Um, but um, it was just a very affecting moment for me. It doesn't matter why I was there. Where the air is sterile and the sheets sting. It doesn't matter that I was hooked up to this thing that buzzed and beeped every time my heart leaped like a man whose faith tells him God's hands are big enough to catch an airplane or a world. Doesn't matter that I was curled up like a fist protesting death, that every breath was either hard labor or hard time, or that either always too hot or too cold. Doesn't matter because my hospital roommate wears Star Wars pajamas. And he's nine years old. His name is Lewis. And I don't have to ask what he's got. The bald head with the skin and bones frame speaks volumes. 
the Game Boy and the Feather Pillow Booms, like they're trying to make him feel at home because he's going to be here a while. I manage to smile the first time I see him and it feels like the biggest lie I've ever told, so I hold my breath because I'm thinking any minute he's going to call me on it. I hold my breath because I'm scared of a 57 pound boy hooked up to a machine because he's been watching me and maybe got a peg doll wrong, like maybe he's bionic or some shit. So I look away. Like he's gonna give me my life back the moment I got something to trade, I damn near pull up my pack and say, cigarette? But my fear subsides in the moment I realize Lewis is all show and tell. He's got everything from a shotgun shell to a crow's foot and he can put them all in context. Like, see, this is from a shooting range, and see, this is from a weird girl. <laughs> I watch his hands curl around a cuff link and a tie tack and realize that every knick-knack is a treasure, and every treasure's got a story, and every time I think I can't handle more, he hits me with another story. He says, see, this is from my father. See, this is from my brother. See, this is from that weird girl. See, this is from my mother. It took me about two days to figure out that that weird girl is his sister. <laughs> It took him about two hours today after she left for him to figure out he missed her. They visit every day and stay well past visiting hours because for them that term doesn't apply. But when they do leave, Lewis and I are left alone. And he says the worst part about being sick is that you get all the free ice cream you ask for. And the worst part about that is realizing that there's nothing more they can do for you. He says, ice cream can't make everything okay. And there's no easy way of asking, and I already know what he's gonna say, but maybe he just needs to say it, so I ask him anyway, are you scared? Lewis doesn't even lower his voice when he says, fuck yeah. I listened to a nine-year-old boy say the word fuck, like he was a 30-year-old man with a nosebleed being lowered into a shark tank, he's got a right to it. And if it takes this kid a curse word to help him get through it, then I want to teach him to swear like the devil's sitting there taking notes with a pen and a pad. But before I can forget that Lewis is nine years old, he says, please don't tell my dad. <laughs> he asks me if I believe in angels. And before I realize I don't have the heart to tell him, I tell him not lately. And I just lay there waiting for him to hate me, but he doesn't know how to, so he never does. Lewis loves like a man who lived in a time before God gave religion to men and left it to them to figure out what hate was. He never greets me with silence, only smiles and a patience I've never seen in someone who knows they're dying. And I'm trying so hard not to remind him I'll be out of here in a couple days smoking cigarettes and taking my life for granted. And he'll still be planted in this bed like a flower that refuses to grow. I've been with him for five days and all I really know is Lewis loves to pull feathers out of his pillow and watch them float to the ground. Almost as if he's the philosopher inside of the scientist ready to say it's gravity that's been getting us down. But the truth is, there's not enough miracles to go around, kid. And there's too many people petitioning God for the winning lotto ticket. And for every answered prayer, there's a cricket with arthritis. And the only reason we can't find answers is because the search party didn't invite us. And Lewis, right now, the crickets have arthritis. So there's no music. No symphony of nature swelling to crescendos. We bend halos into melodies that can keep rhythm with the way our hearts beat. So we must meet silence with the same level of noise the parents of dying nine-year-old boys make when they take liberties in talking with heaven. We must shout until we shatter in our own vibrations, then let our lives echo and grow echo and grow echo and grow distant. Distant enough to know that as far as our efforts go, we don't always get a reply. But I swear to whatever God I can find the time I have left, I'm gonna remember you, kid. I'm gonna tell you stories as often as every story you told me, and every time I tell it, I'll say, see, there's bravery in this world. There's 6.5 billion people curled up like fists protesting death, but every breath we breathe has to be given back. A nine-year-old boy taught me that. So hold your breath. The same way you'd hold a pen when writing thank you letters on your skin to every tree that gave you that breath to hold. Then let it go. As if you understand something about getting old and having to give back. Let it go like a laugh attack in the middle of really good sex. The black eye will be worth it. Because what is your night worth without a story to tell?
And why wield a word like worth if you've got nothing to sell? People drop pennies down a wishing well as if the cost of a desire is equal to that of a thought. But if you've got expectations, expect others have bought your exact same dream for the price of a hard work, hang in, hold on mentality. Like I accept any challenge, so challenge me. Like I brought a knife to this gunfight, but the other night I mugged a mountain, so bring that shit I've had practice. Lewis and I cracked this world wide open, found the prize inside. We've never lied to ourselves. We never told ourselves it would be easy or undemanding. We never dreamt of anyone handing us anything. So we sing in our own vibrations. We dare angels to eavesdrop, to stop mid-flight, to pluck feathers from their wings and write demands that God's hands take the time to catch you. So that even if God doesn't, it wasn't because we didn't try. I don't often believe in angels. But on the day I left, Lewis pulled a feather from his pillow and said, this is for you. I half expected him to say, see, this is the first one I grew. Yeah, like, I mean, I, I, I grew up um, going to Catholic school, which was, you know, a wonderful place to learn how to become you know, an, an atheist, um, uh, oddly enough. Um, just my experiences in that school were not, uh, didn't, didn't lean toward the sort of love that they talked about. You know, it was quite the opposite experience for me. Um, and so that just kind of threw me out of it because I found it very contradictory to, you know, it's that sort of practice what you preach sort of thing. And I felt there was a lot of preaching and not a lot of practicing going on. Maybe not to every student, but certainly toward myself. And yeah. so it just kind of made me fall out of, you know, growing up, I loved going to church because I loved the stories, you know what I mean? And for me, it was, it was a very big part of, you know, sort of influencing storytelling for me. Um, but I grew out of favor with uh, just, yeah, the sort of contradictory nature of what happened understandable and uh so you're a little bit of a fish out of water maybe in catholic school then you get uh, uh put in a, a workshop that's a gospel workshop among uh, i assume mostly all musicians so when i look at the footage yeah. you seem to be again an anomaly a fish out of water uh i I'm, i gather everyone else was going to play a song and you're there with a poem take us back to that moment of <laughs> I, I know you're used to it based on all your festival experience but that's like you're on stage with other people who do a certain thing that you don't do what was it like was it intimidating what was it like to get up there and do your thing it was so intimidating because right off the bat i felt this sort of not not in an intentional uh way but being surrounded by other musicians who are you know, all eyes are on you all of a sudden and, and wondering, it's like, what must they be thinking? Like, I mean, why am I, why am I here? Why am I up here? Yeah. I feel disingenuous being here just because of my own personal beliefs, but that doesn't disclude me from being able to participate or offer something meaningful uh, in talking about this. And so it was, yeah, it was just the most nerve wracking experience uh, for me personally. I think I've ever had at a festival, if I'm being honest. Wow. But did it pay off in the end? Because as I watch the end of your performance, you get like a 20, 30 second roar of an ovation. People loved it. And this is after you did a disclaimer about cussing, worrying right. that there might be some language that some children might find uh, offensive, which is ironic given part of the piece. Uh, right. <laughs> Lewis's uh, interactions with cussing. But anyway, it paid off, would you say? Like, the audience was into what you did. Yeah, like, I mean, despite the emotional turmoil that came with preparing to do that particular piece uh, for that audience, um, it, the response was incredible. So warm and so gratifying and so full of love. And, you know, you, you guys don't get to hear or see what happened after that, you know, sort of ovation that uh, we ended up getting. Um, but the people were, just, everybody wanted to come to you and share some, mm -hmm. some bit of their story or some piece of 
their lives or somebody they knew. And, and that to me is always the most sort of rewarding part of what I do is finding connections with people that previously weren't there. Um, it's one of the things that art does really well is it connects us as much as it can sort of divide us and some, you know, according to our opinions or beliefs, it can also really sort of unite us. Um, and I think we've been missing a lot of that these last two years. Given your opinions on Catholicism, your experience in Catholic school, I need us to jump to a performance you gave at a church in Guelph. <laughs> Hello. Inappropriate people. Think about where we are. In the uh, preamble to this very, very powerful performance, you acknowledge that you're in a church, you feel weird about it. Uh, and we can talk about that if you want, but I think you've established why you might've felt weird about it. So I, I appreciate it. Let's get to the piece itself. It's extremely powerful. It's called Move, Pen, Move. Stay. That's what mothers say when their sons and daughters go away. They say, stay. My mother said, go. So I wasn't there. The night she fell out of her wheelchair so frustrated that she amputated her own legs with a steak knife, or rather tried to her life leaking out of the white floor, blossoming like roses in the snow. See, our relationship was an anthem composed of words like, gotta go. So we went and sent our regards on postcards from all the places we'd been with stories about all the things we'd seen. That's how it was with you and I. Why say goodbye when we could still write? But then it took your hand. We should have practiced our goodbyes because then it took your eyes and I was somewhere in the middle of nowhere watching the sun rise over a stop sign placed down the center line of a highway filled with sudden turns for the worse. Running back home because I got to play nurse. Got to figure out which pill alleviates which, part, which pain. Which part of your brain was being used for a boxing bag as your body became a never-ending game of freeze tag taking place in an empty playground? I was left looking for your limbs in a lost and found and I couldn't set you free. So we just sat there. Our heads bent towards each other like flowers in the small hours of the morning while light wandered in like a warning that time is passing. And you ride along with it bit by bit every day. And all I could say is if I could, I would write you some way out of this, but my gift is useless. And you said, no, write me a poem to make me happy. So I wrote, move, pen, move. Write me a bedroom where cures make love to our cancers. But my mother just motions to a bottle full of answers and says, help me go. And now I know something of how a piano must feel when it looks at the fireplace to see sheet music being used for kindling. Smoke signaling the end of some song that I thought it would take too long to learn. So I just sit here watching you burn away. All those notes I never had a chance to play to hear the music of what you had to say, but I count out the pills. Just to see if I can do it. And I can't even get halfway through it before I turn back into your son and say, stay. I could hook up my heart to your ears and let my tears be your morphine drip. And maybe it's easier to let you slip away than it is to say goodbye. So I hold my breath. Because in the countdown to death, the question of why melts into when. How much time do we have left? Because if I knew what I know now, then move, pen, move, write me a mountain. Because headstones are not big enough. And my mother says, stop it. Write me a poem to make me happy. So I write this. Stay. She smiles and says, gotta go. I know. 
Goodbye. Again, I appreciate that everything you might want to say about it is there in the piece, but can you give us a little bit of background about Move, Pen, Move, and also what it's like for you to have to, not have to, but to be in a position where you, you have to recite this particular poem. I mean, I can't imagine it myself. Can you speak to those things? Yeah, I mean, it's one of the difficult things about what I do is a lot of the pieces that get requested are the hardest ones because people want to go to that emotional space for themselves. Um, it's a bit taxing on me. Move, Pen, Move is a really personal poem for me. Um, it came out of my mother's battle with MS ended. Um, and it was, I had such a difficult relationship with my mom because I was not raised by her. I was raised by my grandparents. She basically had me and left. And so I grew up with a lot of anger um, toward her in my life. And when she did come back into my life, she was already very, very sick. Um, and I, again, that sort of anger resurfaced in that place of my life is just starting and now you're asking me to come and be the one to take you. Where were you to take care of me? Like there were all those sorts of things. But in the end, I was tremendously grateful for the patience she showed me in, in, in that she was there during like, obviously the, the most emotional, emotionally devastating time of her life, um, physically and emotionally. And she was there answering all the questions that I had and giving me the perspective that I didn't have um, growing up because at that time, I didn't want to an ask those questions. But you know, when that, you know, when the, the sands start slipping through that hourglass faster and faster, and you notice there's less and less of them, you realize, I don't, I may not have time, I may not get another chance to ask or say any of these things. And so really grateful to her for being there and it was just a really tough experience for me to say goodbye to someone after just really starting to say hello, you know? Um, and that's what the piece was born from. Yeah. I, I picked up on that watching this performance, um, the interchanging of leave and stay. I could tell you were in conflict. And just as you are now, I could tell at the end, you, by the end of your performance, you are broken. You guys have been such an amazing audience. Thank you so much uh, for being patient with me and for allowing me to do what I do. It's, maybe churches aren't so bad, I don't know. And it's very powerful. And for what it's worth, for hearing it from me, we, we appreciate you putting yourself out there like this. It's it's very moving. Well, I'm sorry that you know we're we're offering up the, all these devastating emotional pieces right now. I don't know why uh, I chose these pieces to showcase, but uh, here we are. Um, no, uh, I think sometimes people just need to hear hear it. You know. It's authentic. We're all going through our own every day during this time, pandemic and lockdown and isolation. We're all going through loss of some kind, like feeling like we're missing everyone and everything. So I think they're poignant choices if, if that's worth anything to you. So again, thank you. Um, I want to talk about the, the piece that you've presented uh, here to us. Uh, I believe it's brand new, or rather, it's I mean, it's obviously not something you performed at Hillside in the past. Uh, tell us about this new piece. Whatever Mountain uh, was, it is very much born from a place of trial, and I feel that's where we are right now. You know, all these things in life, life that we consider challenging have been somewhat amplified. Uh, 
in our current condition. And so I feel like a lot of the times, you know, as much as it's important to talk about, you know, the dark things or how hard they are, it's also important to bolster our spirits. Like, I mean, we're the only ones that can lift our own spirits as heavy as they are sometimes. Um, and so I, I feel like people need to be rewarded a bit after all, all they've been through, after all we're going through, continue to be going through. Um, it's, it's good to have something that, you know, sort of reminds you that it's like, it's not meant to be easy, but you can do this. Look at what you've already done. You know, just look behind you for a second and stare at the footprints that are already there. And, you know, you can soldier on, you can, you can move forward. I think it's important for people to hear, especially considering the times we're in. If you think it will be easy, if you think the path will be laid out before you, or that the trail will have previously been blazed, all obstacles cleared, every footstep already pioneered by those who have gone before you, if you think every barricade will have been dismantled or that every wall will have been removed, if you think pressing your hands into the wet cement of the foundation will have proved to the world you have left your mark upon it, if you think the grit under your fingernails is evidence that you have done enough, or that your rough and calloused hands offer sufficient testimony that you have earned rest. If you think the test will be anything less than an essay question aimed at unearthing the answer of how much you can bear, you will be disappointed. It will require more than that. There will be no welcome mat waiting to greet you at the foot of this mountain. No medal to pin upon your chest when this is done. You will have won nothing by crossing this finish line. It exists only to task you with discovering how much deeper you can go. It will insist that you drill past the I don't know that has stood stubbornly in your way since the instant you first wondered if you could. It will burden you with the challenge of bringing to the surface an understanding of the misunderstood, the excavation of an answer to the question, what now? How do you keep going in a world where the hellos are outweighed by the goodbyes? How do you train yourself to know that you have to battle through the fall if you ever expect to rise because the size of the mountain in front of you is secondary to the fact that there is a mountain in your way? Do what you're going to do about it. Abandon the weight of the world's expectation and go without it. You don't need a finish line to remind you that the way forward exists because of the work you put in forging the path behind you. Effort isn't weighed on scales. There will be times when the last breath in your lungs must volunteer to become the wind in your sails because who else is going to do it? Forward. 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 Faster than full speed toward the colossus of uncertainty that's been laying bricks in your throat to make room for the quiet imposter sent to replace your roar. Your strength is not diminished because others think your struggle is futile. Every time you broke... You will learn to reconcile the pieces and build a better self using what you could salvage from the ruins of your slaughter. Your alma mater was a school of thought where the lessons were taught in reverse. Test first, instruction later. It was a classroom dedicated to the teaching of what can be learned from your failure. The answers were never meant to be easy. You've always known it. You don't borrow the conviction it takes to make yourself practice the impossible. You own it. The heaviest thing you will ever have to lift are your own spirits. They will at times be weighted down with the terrible gravity that is doubt. They will at times refuse to man the lighthouse meant to steer you clear from disaster. You will never master being whole without first knowing that some of the pieces we lose stay lost, and that at times the cost of moving forward is having to leave behind that part of yourself and learn to exist without it, to bow and respect whatever mountain is in your way, but then to do what you're going to do about it. So does the trial that you allude to, does it refer to this collective trial we're going through in terms of it wasn't written with this in mind. I've certainly written a lot about what we're going through right now. There was a piece I was considering called A Tomorrow. Um, but for whatever reason, I just, in this instant, I, I leaned toward this piece in particular um, because I felt like, I mean, as much as it, it wasn't written specifically about this time, 
it definitely applies to this time. Um, so, well, and I think it's a, to be honest, a hopeful compliment to the previous two pieces we've been discussing in a sense, because in those pieces, you, you discuss trials of your own. And I think you've taken those experience from my take anyway, you've taken from those experiences, learnings that can be applied to, uh, you know, conveyed to other people to inspire them. Um, I'm putting words in your mouth, but is that some semblance of where you're coming from? Like it's a hopeful, hopeful piece. Definitely. Like, I mean, I think inspiration is a very important um, element in our lives. I'll call it an element, even though it's quite ethereal. Um, but inspiration is, it's an outside force. And these last couple of years, we've been cloistered into, you know, our spaces and, and forced to exist in, in that arena. And so we haven't been getting that same level of you know, sort of inspirational contact, I guess we'll call it. Um, yeah, so <laughs> to, to, to answer your question, uh, yes. <laughs> does that answer your question? I don't it know. It does. No, it does. Well, Shane, we, we here at Hillside appreciate you, and we appreciate your work. Um, I assume if you have hope uh, about the future, is Hillside a part of your future? Do you hope you can be back here if whatever – form we take at some point? Are you hoping to be back? Always, always. Anytime I get an invite from Sam or Hillside, you know, it's, it's the one thing that I want to say yes to, you know, and I try and move things around to make it happen. You know, <laughs> it's a, a bit like playing Jenga sometimes, but it, it'll always be a place I want to be. It, it holds a very special place in my heart. It, you know, when I was starting, when I was starting to come up through, through the sort of festival circuit, it's like I said, there were a lot of people that were very reticent about, oh, we're not sure if we want to book this because we don't know how it's going to go with our audience and stuff. And so places like Vancouver or Vancouver Island Music Festival and Hillside were the first sort of three that really sort of embraced the idea and and got and and since then it's it's really opened up for me you know when we get to play like festivals down in the states that they're enormous and and it's that same sort of like nerve-wracking experience of oh my god are we the right fit for this because we start to doubt ourselves when we hear from other you know other people it's like well we're not sure what our audience is going to think and yet every time we do it we go and we deliver something that people are hungry for people are looking for you know content that that feeds them emotionally you know there's there's food for thought and then there's food for your heart as well and so i think uh we try to serve up a bit of both well that's well said and by all accounts and from everything i've seen you do do that so thank you uh before i let you go uh i'm curious about two things one if people want to learn more about you i hope you can just tell us where we can get information about you and your work. And secondly, do you have future plans? I mean, you've alluded to some hopeful thoughts uh, for the for the future, right. but is there anything you want to tell us about in terms of releases or virtual or real life events? Uh, definitely. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, uh, if you want to find out more about me or what I'm up to, you can go to my website, uh, which is shanekoizan.com good luck trying to spell it hopefully you guys will put a little uh thing up there so people know um in terms of other stuff that i've been doing in in lockdown i've been writing like mad so uh the creative side of things is going really well i'm really looking forward i haven't done a show in about two years um because of this uh because of what we're going through I'm really looking forward to getting back out um and doing live shows again, it feeds a part of me that um, hasn't been nurtured in quite a while. Uh, so, so yeah, um, I think if it, the the problem has been that you know during this whole during this process, you know, you, we keep booking shows and then we have to cancel them, and booking shows and then we have to cancel them, and now we're in a place where all these venues are bottlenecked because all these artists have been waiting for so long. And so now the line to get into these places, uh, it, it has just 
it's become a bit of a log jam. And so it's really tough for artists right now. And so if you can, I'll, all I'll say is if you can support artists directly, it doesn't have to be me, any artist you love, do it. Take the chance to do it because they could really use it right now. We all could. Once again, thank you so much for you and your spirit and for this time today and best luck in the future. Thank you so much.